Hello and welcome to this talk of the British Ecological Society Annual Meeting 2020, a Festival of Ecology. My name's Owen Petchy and this is a talk uh, in collaboration with a postdoctoral researcher I'm working with, Marcel Suleiman. It's about the evolution and extent of alternate stable states. And it's about predictions of a model of a microbial community. There is a photograph of a lake here because the model is most relevant for aquatic ecosystems like this lake, and particularly lakes where there's strong stratification. This is the relationship that I guess keeps me up at night. Um, what is the relationship between some environmental variability on the x-axis, like temperature, and some feature of an ecosystem that be on the y-axis here. It could be population size, community structure, net primary production. It could even be the trait of an individual organism. What is, the rela what is this relationship uh, looking like? I think this is so important because this relationship determines how the environment, uh, the ecosystem responds to environmental change. And it is actually the relationship that underlies ecological stability. So when we talk about resilience or resistance or variability, it's actually the shape of this relationship that, that determines that, um, that stability. And so what can this relationship look like? Well, here are four examples. In this case, we have an ecosystem that is um, robust or insensitive to environmental variation. There's nothing changing here when the environment changes. In this situation, it's a relative, relatively linear change in the ecosystem property as the environment changes, a relatively predictable situation. And here we have a more threshold or discontinuous um, relationship. Actually, it is a continuous relationship, but it's more threshold-like. And in some regions of environmental change, there's relatively rapid change in ecosystem properties. And in other regions, there is relatively little change in the ecosystem property as the environment changes. And in this final case, as the environment, environmental variable increases, we have this relationship. And as it decreases, we have this relationship. So we've got different relationships in different directions. That's hysteresis. The other thing that we have is for a particular value of the environmental variable, say here, we have one stable state just there, and we have another stable state just here. So we've got alternate stable states or multiple stable states. Um, and so we could have any of these types of relationship. It's a very important question about what features of an ecosystem or an ecological community determine which of these relationships we actually expect to see. Now, theory tells us about uh, one thing that should affect the shape of this relationship, and that is just here, the net positive feedback strength. All right, let me explain. This, relation, this axis is the same as the one in the previous graphs. It's some environmental variable that's, that can change. On this axis, we have the same thing, the equilibrium ecosystem state. And then just here, we have strong feedback on this relationship. So strong feedback here. So when we've got strong feedback, this environment ecosystem relationship is folded. It's like the bottom graph we saw in the previous slide. And we can have alternate stable states and hysteresis. Whereas when we have weak feedback here, we have a relatively linear relationship. So it's the strength of the feedback, and particularly the positive feedback in the system, that can determine the shape of this environment ecosystem variable. Let me just talk about that a little bit more. Um, let's focus on this case here. So here we have an organism and, and some ecosystem property. Let's imagine this is a primary producer. It's producing oxygen. So that's what happens here. And then the ecosystem increases in its uh, dissolved oxygen concentration in the, in the lake, for example. And if that increase in dissolved oxygen concentration actually has an effect to increase the growth rate of this organism, maybe indirectly, but it's increasing the growth rate of this organism. What we have is a, a positive and a positive. And if that's a strong positive feedback loop there, and we get this folded relationship with hysteresis and alternate stable states. On the other hand, if it's a weak relationship, we uh, weak feedback, then we just get um, the linear relationship. 
And so the strength of the feedback, the positive feedback, is one thing that fundamentally alters the shape of this relationship. It fundamentally alters the stability of the system. All right. That's what theory tells us, and it's old theory. It's uh, been around for quite a while. What is new, relatively new, is how evolution may affect this relationship. There was a paper published by Dacos et al. just last year in Nature, Ecology and Evolution, and this is a figure from that, or a couple of figures from that, about hypothetical alterations of the trajectories of ecosystem collapse as a consequence of trait change, so trait change that could happen um, via evolution, for example. In both of these graphs, the black, grey line, black and grey line there is what we've seen before, a folded relationship. It's exactly the same in the two graphs. What's different is in this case, as the environment changes, then the trait changes and that delays the collapse. So this delta E is towards a delayed collapse. And in this case, the trait change causes the collapse to happen earlier. So there, there is early collapse. The question is, well, which of these is likely to happen? And particularly in this um, uh, situation that we're going to look at, a lake ecosystem, and the oxic and anoxic zones and microbial communities that are associated with those oxic and anoxic zones. This very important feature of aquatic ecosystems is how much oxygen is present. I put this paper up because this is the one that um, I've taken the model from. Thank you very much to Timothy Bush and your colleagues for publishing such a nice paper. It actually contains empirical data about the lake that backs up um, the model that they have used and the conclusions of the model as well. Let me describe that model. Well, here it is. Um, this is uh, looking rather complicated, but I'm going to explain it. Um, it contains abiotic um, factors and processes. That's the orange um, ovals here. So we've got phosphorus, oxygen, we've got oxidized sulfur and reduced sulfur, and abiotic oxidization. So we've got these abiotic resources or processes. And then we've got three functional groups of organisms. We've got the cyanobacteria, phototrophic sulfur bacteria, and sulfur bacteria. Right. Then we've got three types of arrow. We've got inhibition, production, and consumption. Now, when we look at this whole thing, we think, well, is there positive feedback here or not? Well, actually, what, what's a bit easier is we just look at part of it. And let's focus on now the, the bits that remain um, bold. And what we see is that cyanobacteria produce oxygen. No surprises there. And actually, oxygen inhibit the growth of sulfur bacteria. That's this red. Um, sulfur bacteria produce hydrogen sulfide, reduce sulfur, and that inhibits cyanobacterial group, uh, growth. So we've actually got a big positive feedback here. Cyanobacteria produces oxygen, which inhibits sulfur bacteria, which would then inhibit the, the production of hydrogen sulfide, which would allow cyanobacteria to grow even more. So it's a big positive feedback loop. And the other elements that are in here that we don't see so much don't change that. All right, so we've got a positive feedback. I'm going to now show you um, some results that show that this positive feedback does cause alternate stable states. And in this first graph, set of graphs, what we have in the left here is what happens when the sulfur bacteria start at high abundance. You can see the sulfur bacteria here at high population density in this graph. And as time goes by, the sulfur bacteria stay at high, high abundance. Whereas in this case here, we start with the cyanobacteria at high abundance. And when we do that, the cyanobacteria stay at high abundance. And this is only changing the initial conditions between these two runs of the model. We can see in this situation we have high oxygen maintained, low, low sulfide maintained, and here we have high sulfide maintained, low oxygen maintained. So the state of the ecosystem de is determined by the initial conditions, and that's a characteristic feature of alternate stable states. We can look at this in another way. Like this one, this is a graph of an environmental variable, oxygen diffusivity, how, mo how quickly oxygen can flow into the system, an abundance on the y-axis. When there is low oxygen, we only have sulfur bacteria in high abundance. When there is high oxygen, we only have cyanobacteria in high abundance. When there is intermediate 
levels of oxygen, then we can have either cyanobacteria in low abundance and cyanobacteria in high abundance, and the same for sulfur bacteria in the opposite direction to the cyanobacteria. So we get these alternate stable states, just like we were looking at before. And here's the relationships uh, with some direction arrows on them. So we do have alternate stable states coming from this model. Now the question is, what does evolution do to this, the extent of the alternate stable state um, in, in that uh, environmental variable, this, this distance for, in the environment for which alternate stable states exist? What does the effect of trait change and evolution have on that uh, region of alternate stable states? This is the question from this paper, Dacos et al., just like we mentioned. All right, so how are we going to manipulate uh, trait change and evolution? What trait is it we're looking at? And we're going to look at inhibition, the red lines here. The reason we're looking at inhibition and tolerance, which is the flip side of that, is because we have evidence that these organisms, in this particular case, one of the sulfur bacteria, can evolve increased tolerance to oxic conditions. So here we have the growth rate of a population of sulfur bacteria that's been evolved in oxic conditions and grown in oxic conditions. And here we have the, well, no growth of the population that was evolved in anoxic conditions um, and then grown in oxic conditions. So we do expect the evolution of greater tolerance. In the model, this tolerance is controlled by looking at how the oxygen concentration in the environment affects the growth rate of the organism. So what's the multiplier on the growth rate? And when there's no oxygen present, the growth rate is 1. Uh, it's not, the, the multiplier of the growth rate is 1. And when there's more oxygen present, say here, then for medium tolerance, this medium tolerance line, we'd get half the growth rate, 0.5. For the low tolerance line, we'd get 0.4, a greater reduction in growth rate. And for the high tolerance line here, we would get a lower reduction in growth rate. That's how the tolerance is implemented in the model. All right, this is what we saw before. The question is, what will putting greater tolerance into the model do to the region of alternate stable states? Is it going to increase this? Is it going to make it wider or is it going to make it narrower? And the answer I'm going to give you on the next slide. So just pause the video and have a think about what you um, expect. Here's the answer. Greater tolerance increases the range of environmental conditions for which alternate stable states exist and lower tolerance decreases that range. All right. The reason is, so imagine we start with cyanobacteria at high abundance here with high oxygen. That's the only state that's possible. And as oxygen diffusivity decreases, there's less and less oxygen flowing in. Well, at some point here, there's not so much oxygen around and the sulfur bacteria start growing. But the growth of the sulfur bacteria does not have such a large effect on the cyanobacteria because they're tolerant. So the cyanobacteria can persist and persist and persist and persist. And only when oxygen flow in is very low do the sulfur bacteria then grow up to high enough abundance that there's enough hydrogen sulfide that it causes the cyanobacteria to basically go extinct. And it works the same in the opposite direction. And this is what, and, and the, the opposite reasoning goes for why lower tolerance decreases this region of alternate stable states. So the answer from this model is that evolution of tolerance is predicted to cause delayed collapse. Delayed collapse and increase that region of alternate stable states, that region of environmental conditions for which we get alternate stable states. Right, so the conclusions. Again, evolution of tolerance is predicted to increase the extent of alternate stable states. Now, something I didn't show you is that evolutionary effects are at least as large as ecological ones. For example, different functional groups being present or absent. Um, and one thing that we still have to do is to put this into an eco-evolutionary model framework um, with trade-offs also. Well, thank you very much. That's the end of the talk. Thank you to the British Ecological Society for allowing me to talk and organising the conference. Thank you to all of you for listening. Thank you to my, for my research group. And... I wish you the very best for 2021. Thank you very much.